one of the most powerful ways to increase your wealth is to increase your free net cash flow. It is to take the income that you produce and invest it in such a way or to or utilize it in such a way that it creates additional free net cash flow. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the difference between income, gross, and free net cash flow and some strategies to really boost that that today's money, uh, the money that you have available right now. We're also talk a little bit about the impact of inflation. I'm Justin Hitt with Sustainable Wealth Secrets. So one of the things we do with clients is we help take their income, whether it's income in a business, whether it's multiple streams of income, whether it's income that they produce residually or it's active to, to their day-to-day activities, and we look at ways to boost free net cash flow. Now, what is free net cash flow? I, we know we're not going to go into the accounting terms, but basically that after at the end of a day, after all the expenses have been paid out and the income has been reconciled, how much cash is left over? What cash do you have to work with? Now, you can measure this daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, or yearly. A five-point win is to have free net cash flow the maximum number of measures, so daily means every day, weekly means every week, and so 50 weeks is a better measure than, than uh, 40 weeks of free net cash flow. And so that we have a five-point win where at the end of the year, we have free net cash flow. At the end of every quarter, we have free net cash flow. At the end of every month, we have free net cash flow. At the end of every week, we have free net cash flow. And at the end of every day, we have free net cash flow. So that's a five-point score. When all of those conditions happen, you're doing the right things. Now, you may not have daily free net cash flow. That's that's possible. It would require you to do some kind of accounting each day. So at a daily level, free net cash flow is more likely to be measured inside of marketing channels, inside of specific systems, inside of uh, like so if you have a retail establishment that each cash register is has a positive net cash flow now if you tally everything up that ran through a cash register and you have less money in the cash register than should be then it's a negative cash flow because you have some shrinkage you have a mistake so it's it becomes an auditing factor but all your cash registers put together against the expense of operating the business may not produce positive cash flow but our aspiration and goal is to make it produce free net cash flow now why well that free cash can be reinvested in what works and moved away from what doesn't. So if you have this measure of free net cash flow, and it's something that once you put all the numbers in the, in the accounting system, you can just pull up a report. Okay, you don't have, There's nothing magic about this. Now, you do have to understand that you, you don't want to gimmick your free net cash flow. Free net cash flow is, is a measure. Now, again, if we're, if we're talking accounting, your CPA will tell you, What's the best measure for you? Because in some cases, like if you're a real estate investor, you you not, might not have any cash flow during the year. You may only have that after you take the depreciation on the properties at the end of the year. Um, if you're a manufacturer, you could have uh, a lot of material costs up front and you won't break even, which is the point right before free net cash flow. Uh, you may not break even for six months. You need to know this. And so you're striving to move towards a positive net cash flow. Now, again, there's taxes, there's other stuff. I want this to be simple for you as a manager or as a business owner or as an individual high-income professional that you basically punch in all the numbers and print a report. Your CPA will tell you, again, which report is best for you. Um, but in order to get to that free net cash number, that means your, your bookkeeping's clean. That means you have an accountability of the money that's in your system. It means you're reconciling at the end of the month. It means you're moving systematically towards a high net worth. Because what do we do with the free cash? Well, the free cash buys assets that cash flow. So you could have intellectual property assets in a business, which is a process or framework for delivering a product or service. That is an asset. If you have some marketing campaign that you know works, it's generating profits, it's generating customers with a high lifetime value, then that is an asset to invest in. So we're not just talking about assets like gold, silver. We're not talking about real estate. We're not talking about 
uh, specifically any type of asset, but because you have the discipline in place to go from the income you received to what is the result of that operation that the income is applied to or the, or is contributing to, um, that whole system in place makes you more durable. It makes you more sustainable. It makes it easier to function. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, you, become, you create this machine that converts the income into the net worth because these assets are going to compile on your net worth. Now, again, it's easier to measure the physical assets such as a home, such as a car, such as uh, equipment. But you, you also, when you're thinking with the free net cash flow model, if you purchase a car that's above the means of the vehicle, so so you can get to work in a Toyota and you can get to work in a Mercedes. When you're looking at free net cash flow, you very often will either get a, a heavily used pre-owned Mercedes or you're going to get the Toyota because the cost of operating the vehicle is factored into whether or not you should even have the vehicle and ultimately what does that vehicle contribute to. So a lot of what we talk about here is sustainable wealth secrets is a shift in mindset. And that's why sometimes we'll cover the topic of a family office. You know, your family owns four or five properties. Which of these properties are cash flowing? So, so for example, a family office that owns several farms. Are these farms at least breaking even? Because if you've got negative cash flow, then you're going to have to take money from someplace else to keep the operations going. So if you're a business and you have negative cash flow, you have to borrow money. At what point borrowing that money, you'll be able to pay it. Will you be able to pay it back or will you be able to profit because you had the money to buy the materials? In the case of a farm, what crops are going to be profitable? This is finance instead of just, you know, a lot of people just try to er out earn themselves. Let's talk a little bit about earnings. Many um, clients have talked in the past. They said, look, free net cash flow, I can't even get those numbers straight. I don't know where I stand. Uh, I get behind on the bookkeeping, and that's fine. I understand. That's, that's a natural part of this system, and, and you need to fix it, but it's a natural part. And they say to me then, well, I earn $250,000 a year, and it looks like my expenses are only you know, maybe $100,000 a year, so I'm doing okay. And I say, okay, well, tell me about your expenses. And they'll talk about lifestyle expenses. They'll talk about their mortgage. They'll talk about their car payments. And I'll say, okay, what about taxes? Okay, what about your health insurance and your life insurance and all that? Are you fully funded on your life insurance? Are you, uh, are you, uh, what if there was a, a problem and your spouse died or you died before your spouse? Do you have your estate plans together? And they're like, oh, no, no, we don't have any of that. We just, we're, just try, we're just trying to make it work. We're trying to earn as much money as we can, and we're trying to, trying to make it work. Well, you make it work by understanding the systems that are in place to protect the income. The systems are in place to protect the assets that you've accumulated. The systems are in place to know whether or not you're making any money. Because sometimes living in that really nice house on the golf course with a really nice car, it might be impressive to your friends who all are trying to impress you by doing the same thing, but you're not turning that income into net worth. And I speak from experience here. I've had a couple, you know, I've been in business for a while and I've had years where in, in you know, six or eight years, I've made more than a million dollars. It's actually take home. And then I look back and I'm like, well, geez, you know, I don't have a million dollars sitting around here to look for it. And then there's other years I look around. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, I got a whole bunch of, a whole bunch going on. Um, and these, so I sought out these methods and these understanding that the gross that you earn is, and, and think about it, gross, gross as an ugly, don't look at it, don't worry about it, because it means nothing. Today, for example, if you're making $100,000 a year and you live in New York, you're, you're poor. You know, groceries are going up in expenses, uh, fuel costs are going up. Uh, rent is going up like crazy. If you own your own property, uh, it might have a high value as far as what they're taxing you on, but it, it, you couldn't just sell the property for that amount. You'd have to pay contractors to clean it up. You'd have to do all these things. And if you sold it as is, you'd, you'd basically get nothing for the property. All that frustration and fear is eliminated when you have a very systematic approach of looking at the numbers and then making decisions based on the outcome, not the current state. 
So even if you do have cash, you know, let's say today you made an extra hundred dollars. You had a free net cash flow today, end of the day, midnight tonight of a hundred dollars. It doesn't mean you go spend the hundred dollars tomorrow. You have to think about, are we going to invest that in the operating cost for tomorrow? Are we going to invest that in the operating cost for down the line? Because we have a cash forecast. Now, when it comes to your, your gross income, I don't even worry about what that number is. Okay. If you've got a $50 million business, and I, I say that because it gets people's attention. I'm, it's a marketing element to me. I say, look, if you've got a $50 million business and you're not making any profits, then we need to talk. Okay. If, there were, if, they, if it's top of mind that they got a $50 million business and they don't know what their net is, they don't know what their earnings are, they don't know what their uh, cash reserves are, they don't know what their um, operator, operating burdens are in sense of overhead and, and you know, you know, major repairs that are coming up in the future. Then when I reveal those things to them, they know they got a problem and they can do something about it. And that's why, again, we do these podcasts so you can be introduced to ideas and concepts. But if you're going around saying, I've got a $50 million business, I should be earning more money. I've got a $50 million business, therefore I'm better off than a $10 million business. Then you're deluding yourself. Because the truth is, and, and I, I'll speak from experience here. Uh, back in the day, I was making $98,000 a year. I was 20-something years old. And I thought I was just like, like nothing I could do would go wrong. Except, uh, after all that collapsed, I realized I was spending $122,000 a year on $98,000 gross. And so the tax man was getting the money. The uh, property manager was getting the money. The employees were getting the money. And I wasn't getting any money. And so I ended up going bankrupt because I owed more money than I was able to bring in in any reasonable amount of time. And everything collapsed. And this happens with Enron, this happens with FTX, this happens with everybody, all well-meaning necessarily, or they could be big, giant, you know, fraud systems, who knows. But the underlying factor is they didn't have a stable structure to continue doing what they were doing because something was broken about it. Now, in the case of FTX and Enron and, and all these other, the, you know, mortgage crisis, this thing that was wrong is that they were cheating people. And so I'm assuming that you're not cheating anybody, uh, but you might be cheating yourself if you can't clearly see from a report, not from a guess, not from a feeling, a report that you're making money. Now, some businesses will tell me that they've got, so we've got these products and they've got this profit. Great. How does that fit in the bigger picture? And I'm not trying to actively piss people off. I'm not trying to make people upset. I'm just trying to help you understand that it's way more complex than people uh, put it out to be. And if you don't have the proper team, like somebody, uh, you know, like a CPA or somebody actually doing finance, then it's very often you might not be making any money. And then the next COVID comes along, the next pandemic comes along, and suddenly you're out of business. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with is that sometimes structurally things are designed this way. So very often when you go look for a mortgage, the bank's going to tell you you can afford way more than you can practically afford. Um, partially because you probably don't tell them about all your debt, but ultimately uh, they want you embedded or in holden to them to pay a mortgage. Corporations are going to pay you less than you can get on the marketplace because they want you to get maximum value from their dollar. Of course, you're going to want maximum dollar for your value. Those two never match up. So you need to have cash and reserves so you can change organizations, so you can move to a different city if you have to, so you can do what's necessary to, to maintain the income levels. Uh, wages will always be stagnant, so you may want to be looking at how you can run your own business or have scalable income, such as commissions or royalties. Uh, you may want to be looking at different types of income. As you get older, you may want more passive income, so that's investments and uh, residuals and things like that. Um, where when you're younger, you may not mind driving hard to get the income, but you have to realize it ain't going to last forever. So again, the free net cash flow allows you to set aside money for cash reserves, buy assets to cash flow, start converting from active income to passive income. It allows you a lot more flexibility than simply working harder or trying to earn more or trying to uh, you know, get the next big thing going on. So again, like I was saying, I... I made $98,000 a year, I was spending $122,000. You can't do that. But if I'm making $98,000 a year gross and I'm spending $98,000 a year, 
basically spending all that I make. I still can't do that because you get taxed. And then when you're making one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars a year, you get taxed even more. And if you haven't planned for that, then you could have a, a creeping living expense that then gets hit at the end. Now, my what is my prescription for this? Okay, and a lot, again, it's not popular, uh, but it, but those who do it will always get results. So my prescription for this is first off intentional thrift. You might make a million dollars a year, but until you know that you're that what you actually are keeping, which is your actual income, your actual earnings, you might get paid, you know, one hundred fifty dollars an hour. But if you're only keeping a dollar of that, then you're really getting paid a dollar an hour. So that's why we look at everyday rates. That's why we look at the, your your lifestyle and balance. That's why we look at the factors that contribute to your ability to continue to earn. So I say intentional thrift. Now you don't have to be a monk, but you know, if you've got two houses and you're only living in one, why not get rid of the other house unless you can convert it to cash flow? So if you've got two houses and one house happens to be generating rent- rental income, that's a different story. If you've got a house that's too big and you find that you're not even using certain rooms in the house, intentional thrift is, is downsizing. Maybe it's an apartment in the city. Maybe it's a, an apartment in the country. Maybe it's, you know, I, I know somebody who's got a, a, a mobile home and they travel from resorts to resort all across Europe and that's what that's just what they do they don't have the expense of it. the house is actually generating income for them while they're off generating income for them you see this is uh it's, it's a difficult concept but number one intentional thrift so so you can even just do it on paper what would it look like if we spent less and next is we want to convert our liabilities into assets that cash flow if you're spending money out, that money needs to circulate and come back to you bigger than it got put out. So if you've got mortgages, if you've got uh, credit card debt, if you've got other things, how do you manage that debt so that when you send money out, the money comes back bigger than it went out? And finally, um, do you have an accurate picture of your money? This is the, the accurate thinking that's necessary to know whether or not you have cash flow because literally when you're looking at free net cash flow, it is a properly set up accounting system where you push a button and then the report comes out. Now, you don't have to be doing the data entry. You could have an accounting firm do this for you, depending on your size or scale. You could have somebody at the office that does it for you. Um, you could have a small organization like a family office that's doing these kinds of things for you and other members of your family. But again, you want to be able to sit down at the end of a month or the beginning of a month and look at a report that says how much cash do you have now? How much cash will you have next week? How much cash will you have next month? How much cash do we expect to have next quarter? Now, again, you want to use the end of the year measures uh, proactively. You might have a year over year measure. You might have a business plan. There's different ways of doing it, but it, it shouldn't be a massive struggle. This money is the lifeblood of what you do day to day. If it's not facilitating the lifestyle that you want, it's not facilitating the, the family relationships. It's not facilitating the safety and security. It's very often because there is no free net cash flow. At the end of the day, you've worked for the government. You've worked for the utility company. You've worked for the bank. You've worked for everybody but yourself. Now, part of intentional thrift is paying yourself first. So you've got to find ways to take money right off the top and put it, make that money work for you. Part of having uh, a clear system for for where the money's coming from and a clear system to do the reporting is to prevent uh, the losses due to identity theft and, and other types of uh, of, of non compliant activity. Uh, but ultimately, folks, the action starts today. You don't have to be a cheapskate, but you do need to know where the money's going. That way, you can focus your efforts, you can narrow your scope, and you can start doing more of what is beneficial. You can work on your health, you can work on contributing factors, and ultimately sustain wealth over long periods of time. I'm Justin Hitt with Sustainable Wealth Secrets. You can ask your questions at www.sustainablewealthsecrets.com. I'm bringing you the real life, real truth facts about converting your income into net worth and ultimately uh, having your, your money work for you rather than you working for your money. Be sure to like and subscribe. 
and visit us at www.sustainablewealthsecrets.com. I'll see you in the next podcast.